Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Tales of Cape Cod in the Old Colonial Courthouse. My name is Jean Will. I'm the president of the board, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Tonight's program is the next to the last program in our 2021 summer speaker series. Our final program is a wrap-up on jazz with Wampanoag tribal member Morgan Peters as our speaker. The program will start at 7 o'clock, the usual time, next Monday night. After that, we will have an annual meeting on November the 15th. Um, it will include a presentation by Anthony San Marco, and his topic is uh, Thanksgiving traditions in New England. Please mark your calendars for that. It will be open to the public, and uh, we hope you'll hear more about it in the coming weeks. Tonight's program is sponsored by Susan and Peter Alephidakis. Um, we thank you. Uh, these programs would not be possible without our sponsors. Now, I'm excited to welcome back to Tales of Cape Cod, a Cape Cod native, a best-selling author, and a long-term friend of Tales of Cape Cod, Casey Sherman. Casey is perhaps best known for his 2009 book, The Finest Hours, as well as Boston Strong, which became the basis of the movie Patriot's Day. I should say both of these books have been turned into, into movies. Casey was born in Hyannis, attended Barnstable High School, graduated from Freiburg Academy in Maine and Boston University. As a television news producer at WBC, he led a high profile investigation into his aunt's murder, which became the book A Rose for Mary. He also authored The Ice Bucket Challenge, and 12, The Inside Story of Tom Brady's Fight for Redemption. Both of these movies, both of these books are now, I understand, being turned into movies. Tonight, Kessie will speak about his recent book, The Last Days of John Lennon, which he co-authored with James Peterson and David Wedge. Please join me in welcoming Casey back to television. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for coming out on a night that, you know, red, the Red Sox are playing the Astros, so I appreciate it. I'll do my due diligence and try to wrap it up as quickly as possible. Um, I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about John, and uh, as was mentioned, I had the great honor, one of the great honors of, of my career, to co-author a book with James Patterson. James Patterson, as, as many of you know, is the best-selling author in the entire world. He's, he's sold more books than J.K. Rowling or, or anybody else. And I got a call, uh, my agent actually got a call from him two years ago after he had read Boston Strong and watched our gripping movie Patriot's Day with Mark Wahlberg. And James has written, you know, hundreds of fictional novels about detectives and serial killers, etc. And he wanted to start to write nonfiction books, but with the same themes of, you know, the criminal element being woven in into them. So he asked my uh, agent, he goes, look, I, I like Casey's work, I like Dave's work, have them pitch me three ideas. And if we, you know, if I land on one, we'll go for it. So I started to think, I gave him three is over a weekend, and I probably wrote 150 pages in two days um, on these three books. Two of them were parochial, and I won't mention them because I'll probably write them myself at some point. But but what what struck me about the Lennon story was, you know, the last five years of John's life. Now uh, I'm sure as as all of you feel the same way. You know, the Beatles were the soundtrack to to, to my life and to my brother Todd's life. Um, growing up, my parents, uh, Donnie Sherman and, and, and Diane Sullivan, who uh, you know graduated from Barnstable High School, they put us in a VW bus in 1974 because they didn't like Nixon, and they brought us to Mexico for six months to a year uh, just to get away. And during that time, every eight track was the Beatles. Occasionally, Todd and I would slip in Jackson Five, and uh, we enjoyed that. But we, we just we were we were inundated with Revolver, with you know uh, the Magical Mystery Tour, and all of the great Beatles albums. And it became kind of the soundtrack to our lives as well. And I had read 
volumes on John, volumes about the Beatles, but those last five years were always a mystery to me. And that's what I sold Patterson. I said, this can be a true crime book, but we also never want to lose John in the pages. He has to stand out. It's got to be his journey. People need to be inspired by him, but also it's a cautionary tale because what you'll see in this story here are three of the themes that we still grapple with today as a society. Um, religiosity, which I'll, which, which I'll get into. Um, the lack of attention to mental health, which I'll get into. And the lack of attention to uh, uh, gun regulations, which I'll get into. And, you know, those three issues became, you know, the core of what ultimately led to John's demise on December 8th, 1980. And where our story picks up, we don't really talk a little, we talk a little bit about how the Beatles became the Beatles from John and Paul getting together at 15 years old, ultimately bringing George Harrison into the fold and later Ringo. And we talk a little bit about the Hamburg experience, but where we pick up is after the I Want to Hold Your Hand, after 1964, it's really 1966 where John's life starts to go down a track that ultimately leads to his death. And what, what many of you probably remember at the time was in 1966, John gave a, an interview to a, a reporter from a, a record magazine in Britain. And John was talking about the success of the Beatles at the time. And he, he made an innocuous comment. He said, well, you know, we're, we're bigger than Jesus Christ. Now, the British press rolled their eyes because that's just John being John. John was a wise ass. You know, John was very acerbic and John was smart. And, you know, but John was, you know, ironic as well. He wasn't saying we're more, he wasn't, both, you know, pumping out his chest. He was looking at the irony of the situation at the time, saying, isn't it funny that you've got four lads from Liverpool and all of the young people in the UK and in the United States, they're all, you know, piling into record stores like they're, you know, we're, we're bigger than the And he was... British press thought anything of it. But as John and the Beatles begin to uh, develop their 1966 American tour, to get death threats. In fact, you know, John's wife, Cynthia, at the time, told him not to go on this tour. You're going to die on this tour. And one of the reasons was because there was a, uh, two DJs in the Deep South at a radio station that was last in the ratings, and they stumbled upon this interview, and they thought, what a great way to build up our ratings and to get people to listen to us. Let's, let's tell our listeners that the Beatles are against Jesus Christ, and let's, let's stage record burnings, book burnings, everything that they could do to dissuade the Beatles from you know, their various tour dates, and they did a lot of tours in the Deep South at the time. And you're seeing right here, you know, the result of that. Um, you know, we look at pictures like that, and I think of Nuremberg in 1938. Um, I don't think in the United States, but it happened, and, and it continues to happen. And not only was this a, a, a you know, kind of a lark and a, a, a harmless threat, you know, kids burning, burning record albums, members of the KKK were stationed outside of the stadiums that the Beatles were uh, uh, performing at. That's, that's a stadium in Maryland. That's not even the deep, they didn't even get to the deep south yet. And you had the KKK stationed outside saying that, oh, we have a plan for the Beatles. And remember, this is 66. So this is less than three years after John F. Kennedy was shot in Dallas. And Ringo Starr tells John, they don't, you know, Americans have a fascination with guns. They shoot first and ask questions later. We shouldn't go to the United States. But Brian Epstein, their manager, all the tour dates were already booked and they would have had to have given back all the money that they had already incurred. So there was, a, you know, there was no way that the Beatles weren't going to perform uh, in the United States at the time. And every single time they performed at a stadium on the South, in the Midwest, and even on the West Coast, they would have to be driven in almost like they had they were uh, felons going to court, meaning that John would have to lie on the floor of the van as they were being 
brought in in um, undercover with with police escort, and it's not the way that they envisioned, you know, their their next tour of the United States. And not only was John afraid, Paul was afraid. George was afraid, and every time that they would perform, kids in the audience would throw firecrackers onto the stage. And Paul, and I interviewed Paul for the book, and Paul would say, we jumped. You know, George, myself, Ringo was behind the drum kit, and nobody even thought of Ringo at the time, so it was just, you know, the guys in front, um, and they, they would all jump away, and they would, you know, they would look at John, and they said, well, if John's still standing, that means we should keep playing. And John never flinched. You know, John understood what he was dealing with at the time and continued to play. But this is their last public performance beside the rooftop concert they gave in 1969. And see the gates. You know, this is Candlestick Park in um, San Francisco. They played six to eight songs that night and ran off the stage and never performed live again and went into the studio. Lucky for us, right? Because had the Beatles not gone into the studio... We wouldn't have had Sgt. Peppers. We wouldn't have had the White Album. We wouldn't have had Abbey Road. But a lot of it was driven by fear, not by the creative process at the time. They were afraid to perform live again in public. And, you know, researching this book, you know, I really focused all, most of my attention on John and the people around John. So again, getting to interview Paul, and I'll, I'll get to that little anecdotal story in a bit, but getting to interview people around him and understanding the relationship he had with his three bandmates at the time. It's amazing to think, guys, that the Beatles were only together for eight years, and we're here in 2021, you know, talking about them. I mean, the, the creation uh, you know, the creative impulses that they had in such a short period of time has never been matched and will never be matched. But they also had been together since they were 15 years old, especially John and Paul. And at that time in the late 60s, as you know better than I do, because I was born in 69, they were the most famous faces on the planet. They were the most famous people on the planet. And people were looking at them like deities and not rock stars. That's a heavy, heavy pressure for four young men. And, you know, they couldn't withstand it. So they, they did split up. And they only split up after this amazing, uh, what looks like an uh, impromptu concert on the rooftop of uh, Apple Records uh, on Savile Row in, in London. In fact, um, it was something that they were working for for some time. Paul wanted a big concert. He wanted to perform in the middle of the Sahara Desert, but they realized, how are you going to get people there? And, <laughs> you, know, you know, Paul wanted to perform in the Grand Canyon. Paul had these big ideas, and God bless Paul, because he kept the, the band together. He was, he was really the creative genius at the end of the Beatles' run that kept John... Um, being interested in Beatles music because, as we all know, John fell in love. John fell in love with Yoko Ono, an avant-garde artist from Japan. And I'm telling you guys, I go back and forth on Yoko. I do. Um, you know, the, we, we all have heard, you know, Yoko broke up the Beatles. And when, when our book uh, was first announced, um, I started to get inbound... Uh, phone calls from a bunch of different people. And one of them was uh, Yoko's uh, lawyer. And Yoko, Yoko's seven years older than John. So Yoko is 87 right now. Well, when we were starting the book project, Yoko was still in her 80s, but she'd suffered a stroke and she was a firm in a wheelchair. But her lawyer was asking, well, what's in it for us? What's in it for us? What's in your book that we're going to be able to, to take? You know, is there a percentage Yoko? I'm sorry. I'm like, hell no. <laughs> you know, that's not what we do. You know, James Patterson's not going to do it. I guarantee you that. I, I, said, I said, you know, I, I will never pay for an interview. You either want to be a part of this or you don't. And, and I will say, I say the one thing that what drove me to the project is that, that people are losing sight of John. You know, because time passes. We're all here because we have a very strong feeling for him. But my daughter's generation doesn't. They have to be. They have to be reminded about who this guy 
was not only who he was, but who the Beatles were. I said, if you, you know, if you uh, cooperate with the James Patterson uh, project, you know, we're talking 600 to a million copies sold of the book, which has happened already. I said, that, that, that's, you know, really teaching a lot of people not be interested in the Beatles and getting them interested. And I never heard back from the lawyer, so I thought, said, okay, well, the lawyers, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to interview Yoko for this project, and, and that was fine. But I will say this about Yoko. John was ready to leave the Beatles. John was so sick of, you know, the, the work pace that Paul had, had kind of generated for the band. Paul was a taskmaster, brilliant. But he, you know, he, he was the business man behind the Beatles after Brian Epstein had, had passed away. And John just didn't, you know, want to, he didn't want to do it anymore. You know, he, want, he was only inspired when he felt inspired, but he was looking to do other things. John was starting to get political. And without Yoko, John would have never been political. John would have never been the political force that we remember him as if Yoko hadn't partnered with him and married him. So let's get back to this uh, concert here. How this all happened was finally John said, and I know I'm in a church and I'm not going to curse, but John said, F it, let's go upstairs. You know, let's give him a concert up there. And it took about 24 hours for all of the equipment to be loaded up and they went upstairs and they went up to the rooftop and, uh, and they hadn't performed again live in, in many years. And, and this man, Ken Mansfield, who I interviewed for the book, is one of the men on the, he's in that white coat. He was a, a executive for Apple Records. So he's up there watching John, Paul, Billy Preston, and, and Ringo. And they, if, if you've ever seen the rooftop concert footage, and we're all in, a, in for a great treat, because Peter Jackson, uh, the director of uh, the, uh, the Hobbit trilogy, uh, he's got a new version of um, Let It Be coming out on Disney Plus next month. And he, he, you know, wove his way through 57 hours of footage that were taken for that documentary. And the ultimate Let, uh, Let It Be documentary in 1970 was all about angst. It was all about four guys at the end of their ropes breaking up. What Peter Jackson saw was, well, that was 20% of what was captured on film. The rest of it was a brotherhood. The rest of it was these four guys getting together again and enjoying the creative process and, and putting out songs that, you know, still resonate today. And that, that, that concert is very, you know, it's, it's beautiful to watch because you watch John and Paul start to play off each other. And Paul even told me, he goes, Casey, he said, you know, we were the greatest rock and roll band ever. And he goes, all we had to do was get on stage. And, and we didn't have to rehearse. You know, once we started to groove together, we knew that there was no band in the world that could beat us. And, and he, was, he was right. And John, <laughs> this is John's uh, wedding day at the Rock at Gibraltar. And he, he couldn't get married in, the, in Great Britain. Um, he was trying to get married in France, and ultimately uh, he, he ended up here. But John, again, was uh, um, really influenced by um, Yoko's visual creativity because John had gone to art school as a child and people, John would always call himself an artist first and a you know, guitar player second and a singer third. Now there's a, there's a famous quote that John gave later on in his Beatles career. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's beautiful. You know, he was um, working on a, a homework project in grade school and the teacher asked everybody in class, um, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And John wrote one word, happy. And she said uh, the next day, you don't understand the, the assignment. And he said, you don't understand life. <laughs> you know, and that was John as a young person, you know, influencing people around him because, you know, this was the first generation post-World War II. John had a, a hellish childhood. Uh, his father had basically given him up. His, his, his wife, or wife, I'm sorry, his mother, Julia, had uh, basically given him to her sister, Mimi, to raise. And John, at 15 years old, was finally getting reinvolved with his mother and spending a lot of time with her. And she was struck down and killed by a uh, drunk driver who was a local police officer who was off duty, never was charged with it. 
and John was about 15 years old at the time. And one of the reasons why John and Paul became so close is because Paul had lost his mother, Mary, to, to breast cancer. This guy I don't really like to talk about, but we have to. Um, Mark David Chapman. Now, remember when I told you a little bit about that innocuous 1966 interview that John gave? Well, this is well before internet. So Mark David Chapman is an unusual kid. He's growing up in Decatur, Georgia. He is, um, he's got mental issues at six years old. I was able to obtain his psychological reports. Every time he goes up for parole, um, all of the psych reports have to be delivered to the parole board. And um, we were able to get access to every psych report he gave since December 8th, 1980. And he had talked about little um, people living in his uh, walls. He was fascinated with death at an early age, but he had this whole world living within his walls and he could kill these little people, you know, when he wanted to. And he would, you know, at five, six years old, his parents were uh, a lot of domestic abuse back and forth. Um, but he was, a, he was a troubled kid and he never, ever got help, but he was a huge Beatles fan. First album he ever got from his father was Meet the Beatles. And, um, but he was a very, he was a guy that was easily seduced and easily influenced by anybody that was willing to be friends with him because he was awkward and, you know, just not somebody that you would immediately be gravitate, you know, gravitate toward. So he became a hippie because the Beatles were hippies, did a lot of drugs in the late sixties. Then he, um, joined a, an ultra right wing, uh, Christian group in Decatur, Georgia, in the early 1970s, when he's 17 years old. And everything's about, you know, it's, it's co-opting the Jesus story for their own personal, uh, um, you know, reasons. So Mark reads the article about the Beatles big, being bigger than Jesus Christ. So this is right after Imagine came out. And Mark starts to sing, because he was playing guitar at the time. Imagine John Lennon was dead. And he's singing this to his family. He's singing this to his friends. He puts himself on a path. Now, what we've been led to believe since 1980 is that Mark David Chapman killed John Lennon because he wanted to be famous. That's part of the story. But the story actually begins when he's 17 years old. But John has no idea who Mark David Chapman is. John is moved to New York City because he felt like New York was the Rome of its time, and he wanted to be a part of where all of the creative minds were in the world, and they were all in New York in the early 1970s. But John was, um, you know, an illegal alien, and I put that in quotes, because he had been arrested for cannabis possession in London back in the late 1960s. And this was resin that um, these police officers had found in a binoculars case. And John, to his dying day, said that wasn't even our stuff because we smoke pot all the time. But we had rented the apartment, the flat, from Ringo, who had just rented it to Jimi Hendrix. He goes, that was Hendrix's stuff. That wasn't our stuff. <laughs> we knew the police were out there. We, you know, we, we cleaned this thing flat. But it was, a, it was basically a setup because there was a, a certain British uh, police detective who was becoming a celebrity for busting the Rolling Stones, for busting the Who, and then, you know, the big Magilla was, was John Lennon, while Yoko was pregnant at the time. And John, uh, uh, Yoko lost the pregnancy. She miscarried because of that. And John just paid a fine because he didn't want her to suffer any, any longer than she did. And he, he said it was his. It was a $200 fine. He never thought he'd have to deal with it again in his life. But when he moved to New York City, it became, you know, uh, much more than a thorn in his side. And the FBI started to really follow John in the early 1970s. And they did so because John gave a concert for another young man who had been busted for pot possession. This guy's name was John Sinclair. John Sinclair lived in Michigan. And he sold two FBI agents, two undercover FBI agents, two joints. Was sentenced to 10 years in prison for it, for that. So it became a cause celeb. The Black Panthers got behind him. You know, Abby Hoffman got behind him. They had a, you know, a kind of a, a fundraising concert uh, for John Sinclair in Detroit. 
and Bob Seger played. I mean, the, the concert's great. There's a lot of great people that played, but John Lennon got on stage after midnight with Yoko, and John sang a, story, a song that he had written about John Sinclair. And within 10 hours, John Sinclair's sentence was commuted by the governor of Michigan. That's because of Lennon, because of nobody else. Because John's impact was so huge at the time, he was able to literally open prison doors. And you know what? That scared the living bleep out of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon did not want any part of John Lennon. Richard Nixon put John near, near to the top of Richard Nixon's so-called enemies list. So it's interesting, I got the classified FBI notes from that concert in Michigan. And the FBI uh, uh, agents were all undercover. And you can imagine what they must have looked like at this, at this uh, concert, sticking out like sore thumbs wherever the hell they were. And they're writing these notes about the concert afterwards to J. Edgar Hoover. And, but <laughs> the, the notes are critiques of John's music. They're not talking about, well, John sounds a little flat tonight, and God, Yoko is horrible. Um, so John understands and starts to get word that you, because you have a, a so-called felony on your record, uh, uh, an arrest for drug possession, you can be deported from the United States. So John began to be followed. John lived on Bank Street in Greenwich Village with Yoko, and there was always an FBI agent parked you know, across the street. Every time John would leave, he would leave, and they would follow him. John was under the belief that his phones were tapped, and, and we know now that they were. And John told his friends that, you know, if anything happens to me, protect Yoko, because he thought in the early 1970s that the United States government was going to kill him. So that's one of the reasons why John started to retreat from public life. You know, you have George, you know, going on an incredible solo career, Paul doing his thing, Ringo making his solo records, and, you know, you may not realize this, but Ringo is the most successful solo artist of the Beatles. It's Ringo. Nobody believes that, but it is. Again, this is, uh, you know, John Winston Ono. John changed his last name to Ono, uh, you know, to befit y Yoko. And this is what John was fighting for, for, for many years. And ultimately, John wins uh, the right to stay in the United States. And he had people like Norman Mailer, Gloria Swanson, of all people, who was a legendary uh, actress, Sunset Boulevard. She became friends with John because they shared a uh, microbiotic diet, of all things. Um, but people were writing, um, you know, about John on John's behalf, including Geraldo Rivera. You know, whatever you think about him today, he was best friends with John and Yoko in the early 1970s um, because Geraldo had exposed abuse at a, a, a mental hospital in New York in the early 1970s where patients were, you know, left without clothes and abused for, for months. And he brought a, a hidden camera into the hospital and uh, broke a, a huge story at the time. And Yoko called the TV station and said, we want to meet you. You know, you're, you're, you're one of the people that are trying to change the world here and, and, and we want to surround ourselves with people like that. I interviewed uh, Geraldo for the book, and you can read a little bit about that in the, in the story as well. John, um, after the uh, uh, big win for his deport, uh, deportation case, they decide to settle in New York City permanently, and they, they buy a place in the Dakota. Uh, raise your hands if you've ever been to the Dakota or have been, seen it physically. So this is, this is where uh, the, the movie Rosemary's Baby is, is supposed to be <laughs> take place, the facade you can see. But uh, John and Yoko liked it because it was very private. Um, Roberta Flack lived there. Uh, a few other celebrities lived there. And John and Yoko had to convince the co-op board that they were, you know, their drug history was behind them. And many of you probably, if you're John fans or Beatles fans, you have heard the story about the lost weekend where John and Yoko broke up for almost two years. Uh, John went to L.A. and really kind of sowed his wild oats because he'd never been a single guy. John was married to Cynthia very early, uh, even before the Beatles, um, you know, fandom. So he needed to just be a, a free person, and so did Yoko. And it was Paul McCartney 
who brought Yoko and John back together. So people think that Paul hates Yoko. He doesn't. You know, he's the one who brought John back together with Yoko. And once they, became, once they got back together, they decided to have a child. Sean. Now, I get a little emotional because people, you know, get um, frustrated that there were five years that John wasn't recording. Um, five years that could've, he could have given beautiful music to the world. Well, he was giving beautiful music to that boy. Those are the only five years that Sean would have with John. Um, so, you know, you talk about fate and serendipity playing a role in, in all our lives. And I certainly see this with John Lennon. And when John reverted inside the Dakota, he was still writing. But he was writing so bits of songs on his beautiful white piano and putting them aside, never thinking he would record them again. He was the mom and dad for his little boy, Sean. Yoko Ono was running the family business at that point. Because at that point, John Lennon was worth about $2 million. Uh, Paul McCartney was worth $25 million because Paul, Paul's a smart businessman. So John said, mother, we called Yoko mother, you know, let, let's, let, let us be as rich as, as, as Paul is. Because they were, they were brothers, but they were still in competition. So Yoko took over the business, and John raised this, this beautiful, beautiful boy. During this, this time, John is under threat. And people don't know this. Why did John retreat to the Dakota? Was it a Howard Hughes type of situation? Was he just so sick of the world that he wanted to get away? It's part of it. But he was being threatened by a terrorist group. And I've obtained all of the classified documents from the FBI that stand this story up. There was a terrorist, a separatist group from Puerto Rico back in the late 1970s that was threatening John Lennon. And they were a fringe group that was yearning for Puerto Rican uh, independence at the time. So they wrote John a letter and they said, John, we are going to kidnap your child and your wife. And, you know, John had gotten threatening letters since 1966, right? But these terrorists were able to pinpoint exact areas of the Dakota that they had gotten access to. So John knew that they'd been inside the building and they could get inside the building. So what John did at that time, which you know really was against everything John had believed in prior to that, he called the FBI, the very agency he hated and thought was trying to either kill him or get him deported for false reasons. And the FBI began to investigate this case over a period of six months. And John received probably 16 letters. And they were all getting more violent. And it was all, you need to give us $100,000 by this date, or we're going to kidnap your kid. So John actually hired a former FBI agent, uh, this guy, um, uh, McDougal, uh, Jack McDougal. And Jack McDougal's job before he worked with John, was he was a counterintelligence agent for the FBI chasing down Soviet spies in New York City. So McDougal uh, gets the job, and John and Yoko say, protect the boy. Don't worry about us, just protect the boy. And McDougal says, um, no, well, John, you're the most famous person in the world. I need to protect you as well. Just focus on the boy. So McDougal, his name was Doug McDougal, not Jack. So McDougal begins to monitor and you know, walk uh, little Sean around the city and protect him if he went out to Central Park. But Yoko at the time was really into new age thinking. And remember Nancy Reagan, who was into numerology, uh, you know, with, with Ron, so was Yoko. So Yoko was started to tell this bodyguard, well, today it's Wednesday, which means these numbered streets are uh, bad luck. You have to walk Sean on these other streets. And McDougal says, you're out of your mind. He goes, you, if I do that, you're giving the terrorists a pattern on, on how, to, how to abduct your child. So the, the FBI agent is fired from his job. And John, at that time, ret retreats fully in to the Dakota because the terrorist group just got sick of hounding John. So they wrote him one last letter. We don't want your money anymore. We don't want your fame. 
we're going to kill you. We're going to kill you at a public place. So if you're out with your wife and, and your son at, at a cafe, we're just going to blow it up and you're going to be part of our cause. So John was not only so concerned about Sean and Yoko, he was concerned about collateral damage. He didn't want anybody else to be harmed uh, you know, because of what he was going through at the time. The FBI was never able to trace those letters. They did have prime suspects, but those uh, individuals are still um, free today. This is an interesting picture, and there's a great story behind it. So John, as I, as I mentioned to you, Yoko was really big in numerology. So this is early 1980. John's been a house husband for about five years. And Yoko was going to this Japanese numerology sensei, if you will. And the sensei would tell Yoko, there's a dark cloud around your husband. And she'd say, well, how do we get rid of this dark cloud? John needs to go on a trip. John needs to travel. So in early 1980, John and one other person took a worldwide trip by themselves. They went to Japan, they went to China, they went to South Africa, uh, they went all over the place. And there's no recording of that trip, there's no diary of it, no one knows what happened during that trip, but when John got back to New York City, that Japanese sensei said, there's still a dark cloud around you. You need to take another trip, but you need to do it on the water. So John takes two weeks of sailing lessons. Yoko hires a crew out of Newport, Rhode Island, and they take a 40, I think it was a 42-foot vessel from Newport to Bermuda on a sailing trip. And it's John and four other people. Well, during the trip, again, John's got the least experience out of anybody. The waves are really strong. And so strong that the whole crew gets sick. They're all in the cabin um, throwing up on each other. But, but John had a cast iron stomach because he'd kicked a heroin habit, you know, five or six years earlier than that. So he was the only one who could sail that vessel. And he's sailing it on his own. And we're talking about swells, you know, maybe eight feet high, which are huge, you know, for an inexperienced sailor like John. But this was John's rebirth. John coming out of his womb after spending five years in the Dakota. John begins to sing sea shanties. He's yelling at the, the, the gods to strike him down. He's, he, you know, he, in his own diary, said he had basically stripped himself naked. And he's sailing and he's letting the rain and the wind pelt his, his, his flesh and his skin. And he's becoming reborn again. And by the time he lands in Bermuda, he's ready. He's ready to record. And so he spends the next several weeks in Bermuda writing what ultimately will become Double Fantasy. Now, Double Fantasy, that's the name of a flower that he found in a botanical garden in Bermuda. And John had all of these, you know, these notes, these lyrics that he had, and he just had to compile them together. That's John in Bermuda. And John was there basically by himself and with Sean. Yoko would come around sporadically, but Yoko's idea was, okay, John is coming out for the first time. It's the biggest musical news in the last decade. Everybody's been waiting to hear John Lennon. And John, because he loves Yoko so much, he gives half of the tracks of the album to her. I don't know if you've ever heard those songs. They're the worst songs you'll ever, they're earworms that you'll never get rid of. But again, it shows how much John loved Yoko. And I don't think Yoko loved him to the degree that she, that he loved her. I really think that, you know, no matter what you say about Yoko Ono, John worshipped everything about Yoko. So again, John begins to record. There's Yoko behind him at the, at the recording sessions, and they're building, you know, some great songs. Some songs that, you know, continue, that haven't been heard even to this day because Yoko wouldn't release them. But John does not know that there's somebody out there lurking in the shadows. And I put this picture up because it goes back to my conversation with Paul McCartney. And again, when you're a journalist and a writer, you know, there are interviews you do that stick with you. And growing up with the Beatles, to, to inter have the opportunity to interview Sir Paul McCartney, you know, is, is a thing that I'm always going to s have stay with me. It's all about the journey. It's never about the destination. And I asked Paul, 
what the last conversation he had with John was like. Did he remember it? And he said, yeah, he had talked to John maybe a week before John's murder. And I said, well, what did you talk about? And Paul said, well, there was a a bread shortage in England because there was a baker's strike. And I had to call John um, because John had been baking bread for Sean for five years. So John had to tell me how to bake bread. And I thought, wow, isn't that so beautiful? You've got the Mozart and the Beethoven of their generation. And the last time they talk isn't about musical composition. It's about providing for their families. And I just thought that just is such a beautiful memory for, for Paul to have. And as I mentioned, John or Paul didn't know that this man existed. And by this time, Mark David Chapman is in his 20s. He is married to a young Japanese woman who looks eerily similar to Yoko Ono. He is going down a very dark path. He tried to commit suicide twice. He's writing his name. He was a security guard at that time living in Hawaii, writing his name as John Lennon on the ledger. He had never forgot the idea that he was going to kill John, and he realized that his life was so miserable that ultimately there was a part of him that wanted to be famous. And not only did he have John Lennon on his hit list, he had several other people on his hit list as well. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, um, Jackie O, Paul McCartney, Walter Cronkite. In fact, um, before this night, December 8th, 1980, uh, John, uh, Mark David Chapman, rather, had gotten into the, um, the election night party with uh, President-elect Ronald Reagan. So there was a possibility that Mark David Chapman could have killed Reagan at that night, but he didn't. He waited for John Lennon, and this is a shot outside of the Dakota, that's Mark David Chapman getting John Lennon's autograph on a copy of Double Fantasy. 24 hours before that incident, Mark David Chapman meets another musician on the subway. And we interviewed James Taylor about this. James Taylor met Chapman. And Chapman was odd, but you know who wasn't odd on the subway in the 19, you know, early 1980s in New York? But he kept on talking about John Lennon, John Lennon, and he just gave uh, Taylor, you know, the, the, uh, the chills, and Taylor just got off the uh, uh, subway and, and went about his merry way. Taylor was two boat buildings down from the Dakota when he heard the five shots that night. Didn't realize that it was his friend, John, because uh, James Taylor had been signed originally by Apple Records, and John and Paul McCartney had actually sang backup on some of uh, James Taylor's earlier recordings. So here you have John Lennon. John, this is the first time that John Lennon saw Mark David Chapman that night. John signs his album. John gets in a limo. He goes to do an, a radio interview, and then he records until about 10.30 at night. And Yoko, at that point, everybody's hungry. Yoko wants to go to a, an all-night diner and eat. And John says, no, i got to put Sean to bed. Sean's waiting up for us. And so that's what brought John back. And then Mark David Chapman was across the street, emerges from the darkness, and fires those shots. This is the scene moments later, um, when obviously everybody started to learn who had been shot that night. Now, we also interviewed uh, all the police officers that responded that night. Mark David Chapman was there holding a, a copy of Catcher in the Rye um, because he had become a Salinger uh, you know, devotee at the time, and he had actually uh, written letters to Salinger, and Salinger never wrote him back. But he believed himself to be Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye. And um, what the cops told us was Chapman was so afraid that people would hurt him because people were getting to the scene after he just killed John Lennon, and he, he, was, and he thought Yoko was going to hurt him. And he said, please don't let her hurt me. And the cops, you know, to their credit, said, nobody's going to hurt you, Mark. We're going to take you down and process you and kind of find out where this, where this happened. Well, as all of this is happening in real time, um, that's Yoko at the police uh, precinct that night. Um, there's an ABC producer, this guy named Alan Weiss, who I interviewed for the book. He took me to dinner in uh, New York City. Actually, I took him to dinner. It cost me about 500 bucks and six hours of my life. And... <laughs> 
I'm glad it was recorded because we both didn't even make it out of there. Um, you know, thank God for Uber uh, at that night. But the story he told was he was a producer for CBS, uh, for ABC News, I'm sorry. And he was at the ER at Roosevelt Hospital because he had been involved in a motorcycle accident. You know, he, he uh, fell off his bike and got road rash on his, you know, a bunch of skin abrasions. And he's laying in the ER and he sees a uh, stretcher come in and wheel past him. And then momentarily later, he sees a Japanese woman coming in. And he says, is that, is that Yoko? And he's starting to think, oh my God, there's a story here. So he, even though he's being treated, he's you know, a journalist first, and he's trying to think, is this John Lennon that's been brought in? Now, I also interviewed a doctor, a surgeon, an ER surgeon named David uh, Halloran. David Halloran massaged John Lennon's heart that night. He had brought it out of his body and, and, and tried to, John Lennon was DOA when he got there, but Halloran said, you know, we do this for everybody. We don't give up. And he didn't know who it was because, you know, John's glasses were off. John didn't have any identification on him. They were all in the rumpled up clothes in the uh, corner of the ER. And finally, somebody said, uh, a nurse picked up that leather jacket or John's leather jacket. Um, and, uh, and they've rifled through the pockets and they found his wallet. And there was a black credit card in American Express, John Lennon. He said, do you know who this is? And that's when it all came down to the people that were in that um, emergency room trying to save John's life. But again, they tried, they tried, and they couldn't do it. Um, so here is Alan Weiss, who's got the scoop of the century. John Lennon is shot. John Lennon is dead. He's gotten confirmation um, by you know the orderlies. And at that point... That, you know, you have that information, you run with it. So he limped, him, limped his way to a payphone in the hospital and he called ABC News. And it just so happens that uh, the Patriots were playing the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football that night. So the person that broke the news of John Lennon's murder to the entire world was Howard Cosell. So that call had to go all the way to Miami where there was a, you know, a truck outside of the stadium in this confirmation that John Lennon is murdered. And Howard Cosell knew John Lennon. John Lennon, if you go on YouTube, there's a, there's a, a, a piece of film where John Lennon is actually in the booth during a, a Monday night football game talking to Howard Cosell. And it's really interesting because John is trying to compare it to soccer and realizes how big football is in America. So again, Howard Cosell knew John. Um, but Howard Cosell, being the football guy that he was and the professional broadcaster, he wasn't going to announce it um, because it was the, the, um, the football game was about to go into overtime. And he thought, you know, there's playoff implications. We can't just announce this. And it was Frank Gifford that said, no, you have to announce it because this news is going to change the world. And it did. And that's how we, everybody in this room first heard that John Lennon had been assassinated. There's, if you all recall, the you know, wonderful moment, very tragic indeed, um, John's only public uh, memorial service. Now, John's body was cremated. Um, it's ironic that the FBI agent that had been uh, fired for not uh, willing to go by Yoko's idea of how to protect their son. He had an interview to get his job back the day after John was assassinated. So that was a scheduled interview that he had with Yoko because he'd reached out to Yoko. He said, you're coming back. John is coming back. He's the biggest figure in the world. He needs protection. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you. You know, December 9th, we'll, we'll book an appointment. Well, December 8th happened and John was killed. So McDougal, Doug McDougal, his job at that time was to get Julian Lennon off a plane from uh, London. Now, Julian was John's first son. And there was an interesting, sad relationship between the two of them. All of the love that John put into his relationship with Sean, he did not put into his relationship with his teenage son, um, which is tragic. And I think that's one of the you know, those things that you question about John, as beautiful a human being as he was, he was still very edgy and very conflicted. 
Um, but McDougal had to get Julian off the plane and get him to the Dakota. And his, as he's walking um, Julian into the Dakota, a fan lunges forward, and McDougal, to the you know to his dying day, said, "I think I broke that guy's arm." He goes, "I don't know what that guy had in his arm, but he didn't. He, you know, he didn't get anywhere near Julian because I had him down and I heard something snap." And, uh, and Julian was able to, uh, to get in there unaccosted. But McDougal had to bring John's body to uh, a mortuary. And because of every news organization was following the trail of John's casket, um, they had to hire two hearses. One, a decoy, and the hearse that McDougal took. And McDougal took John's uh, remains to a mortuary in Long Island, brought it back in a, um, a, a basically a, a flower box that you'd normally fill with roses. And when he got back to the Dakota, he talked to uh, John's, you know, uh, personal assistant. And the Dakota said, uh, the personal assistant, Fred Seaman, looks at uh, McDougal in the box and he goes, what is that? Because that's the greatest rock and roll man that ever lived. So I... I, I, I put this picture up there because I think it's poignant and it's prescient. As I mentioned, you know, this is a story about lack of mental health issues or recognizing mental health, lack of gun laws and religiosity. There was a figure among those 200,000 in that park, Central Park that day, and his name was John Hinckley. Eight months later, he tried to kill Ronald Reagan. So, you know, when we were starting the process of uh, going down this road and writing the book um, that ultimately James Patterson would edit, you know, it all became access, right? I talk about the incredible opportunity to interview Paul and a lot of the people around John and then getting into, you know, who Mark David Chapman was. Um, we had sent an email to uh, the prosecutor for uh, Lower Manhattan requesting any files that he had on John Lennon's assassination. And we have to do that just to cross our uh, T's and dot our I's. We never thought we'd hear from this person again because nobody, including 60 Minutes, had been granted access to these files in 30 years. So we send the email, we don't hear anything, and then we get an email back. Uh, access uh, accepted. Your, your, you know, your recommendation has been granted, but it's going to take us 24 hours to gather up all of the information that we have. And myself and my co-author are looking at each other like, oh my God. Some intern must have gotten on the computer and just said, oh, I guess these guys you know, must, must be granted this permission. So he allowed us to do it. So with, the next day we're on an Acela from Boston to New York and we're waiting for that other email to say, yeah, you know what? <laughs> Sorry, guys, but uh, you're, you're bleep out of luck. It doesn't happen. And we finally get to the uh, criminal courthouse in Lower Manhattan. And um, we go up to the 10th floor, and we, we have our little uh, ticket, which we printed out. It's a numbered ticket. And we give it to the clerk, and he looks at it, and he's, you know, there is a big partition of glass. And he goes back, and he looks along his wall. And that's where all the case files are of any different criminal uh, case that they were adjudicating at the time. And he, he matches our ticket up with this thin vanilla envelope and pulls it out. And we're like, oh, God, you know, we came, we came down here for nothing. I don't know if you guys have seen the show Storage Wars, where you basically gamble on a storage unit and you don't know what's in it. It could be a treasure. It could be nothing. That's what we felt. We had to do it. Um, and he, he looks at that manila, manila envelope and he realizes it's wrong. And then he comes over and he pulls down a huge box. And inside that box is over a thousand documents, you know, going back to that night, including the original arrest warrant from Mark David Chapman. So holding it, this is his signature from 9th, December 8th, 1980. It's, it's a very ethereal feeling. It's not only something to write about something, but you have to look at it and feel it. And a lot of times, any books that I've ever written, that's what brings you a little closer to the subject matter. And I remember um, at noon that day, the whole courthouse shuts down for an hour for lunch, and we're you know trying to copy everything we can, and but we we get kicked out of the building. 
and we find an Irish pub about a block away from the building. And this Irish pub is a typical Irish pub in New York City. We walk in there, and what do we hear on the jukebox? John Lennon, all you need is love. And no way is that song playing in an Irish pub in New York City. You know, we just thought, geez, isn't this incredibly ethereal? You know, there, there is something guiding us here. And ultimately, it became the story that, that we told. And again, if you, if you buy the book, and I'll be happy to sign it for you, um, it's, it's a story about John. You know, as much as we have to include the killer, because I think it's a cautionary tale, it's really a story about triumph, and John is at the, at the, at the heart of it. And that's why we're all here tonight, um, you know, 41 years almost after his tragic death. But he stays with us, and that's what Paul said to me. He's with me every day. He goes... You know, John left his, his, his body in 1980, but there's not a moment that I don't feel him, that I don't see him, that I don't hear him. And I think that anybody that reads this book, you know, will get the same, same story as well, hopefully. Um, while I have you here, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I pro- published two books in uh, 2020. And the second book, which also became a New York Times bestseller, is a little different. It's called Hunting Whitey, The Hunt for Whitey Bulger. Now, anybody here has heard about Whitey Bulger, may have read some books about Whitey Bulger. We didn't care about that when I first decided to write this story. It wasn't about, this is a story not about Bulger's crimes, although I go back into it. It's about Bulger's 13 years on the run and how he was captured, um, which to me was the fascinating untold story about Bulger. And the one thing about being lucky as a journalist and as a writer, you know, we got access to everything the FBI ever had. Because finally they said, look, you know, Bulger was a bad guy and he co-opted people in the FBI for years. You know, that story's been well told in, in movies and uh, in, in several books. These are pictures of Bulger. But, um, you know, these FBI experts and analysts came along years later. And they'd only heard rumors about Bulger. And they wanted more so than anything to find and capture Whitey Bulger again, who had gone on the run in 1994. In the book, um, Hunting Whitey, I got access to 70 letters that Bulger wrote in his own hand. I'm the only journalist, along with my partner, who has gotten access to Whitey Bulger's apartment in Santa Monica, California. So we got inside. We weren't reporting on the outside. We got inside. We walked the grid. We saw where Whitey Bulger was hiding out for the last years of his life. And he was hiding out with his girlfriend, Catherine Gregg, who became the key to Bulger's ultimate demise. Now, Bulger, when he first went on the run, he and his girlfriend ended up here, Grand Isle, Louisiana, which was just hard hit by a hurricane a couple of weeks ago. I interviewed the family that they had taken under their wing while they were there, under the aliases Tom and Helen Baxter. And they basically brought this family who was down on their luck to Walmart, bought all the kids' groceries and, and clothes for uh, school. And the connection that Bulger had with, with this family were their pets. Bulger and his girlfriend were huge animal lovers. Bulger could kill you without even looking at you. But you want to harm a dog? And he'd weep. And uh, one of the young men in this family had a, had a dog that had a litter of puppies. And there's no, you know, there are very rudimentary vets down in the bayou of Louisiana. So when that puppy got sick, they had to take it out back and kill it. And Bulger was there at the time. And Bulger said, you know, I know you're going to shoot this puppy, but don't let me see it. I have to walk away. And as Bulger's walking away, he's weeping when the gunshot is fired. So you have this really unique, you know, sociopath at play here. And these are some of, you know, the results of Bulger's demonic acts, if you will. This was a girl, uh, her name is Debbie Davis. Uh, Her remains were uh, unearthed, and myself and my co-author were down, you know, while the FBI and the state police were were digging up her body uh, well over 10 years ago. This is interesting. Everybody seen The Departed? So has Bulger. Bulger watched this movie the day it came out in San Diego, California while he was on the run. And there was another person also in the cinema at the time. Some people might recognize the name because he graduated from Barnstable High School. His name is Richard Eaton. 
Richard Eaton, everybody knew him as Huffa when we were growing up, was a deputy sheriff in San Diego in the early 1990s, and he was testifying at a drug trial across the street at the courthouse. But there was a uh, big lapse in testimony, so he wanted to catch this movie allegedly about Whitey Bulger. So here he is in a darkened theater, and he looks four rows down, and there's Whitey Bulger watching the fictitious version of himself on screen. And that's kind of who Whitey Bulger was. He really believed in his own mythology. The unfortunate thing for uh, Eaton was Eaton was unarmed. Eaton had to leave his weapon, his service weapon, at the courthouse. And he always knew that Bulger was lethal and armed, regardless of his age. And he didn't want to create an incident in the middle of a packed theater because people would have died. And he chased Bulger onto a trolley that headed south toward Mexico, and he never saw Whitey Bulger again. But he notified the FBI immediately that Bulger is in Southern California, and the FBI never picked up on it. They never tracked it down. They never followed up on the, uh, on the alleged sighting. Instead, they spent mo most of their time in Italy, France, London, great places for an FBI agent to go on vacation, you know, on the off chance you might find Bulger, you know. Didn't happen, of course, because Bulger was right almost exactly where Richard Eaton was. And then this woman takes over the investigation. What I love about her is she's a female. Her name is uh, Noreen Gleason. Whitey Bulger hated women. He always treated them like third-class citizens. He killed two women with his bare hands. So you have a, a, a FBI agent who's the second special agent in charge of the Boston office. She comes up to Boston from New York, and she asks her, um, her boss, what's, up? what's my priority? Find Whitey Bulger. She's like, really? Do you really want to find him? And then she goes into the pen where all the FBI agents are, and she looks at all the guys, and they've got their heads down at their desks. They look like they're beaten. She's like, not with these guys. I want to bring in my own heavy hitters, my own fugitive hunters from outside Boston. If you really want to find them, I'll find them for you. And within two years, they were able to find Whitey Bulger, and they did it through um, basically these photographs right here. So Catherine Gregg, as I mentioned, was Whitey Bulger's girlfriend on the run, but there had never been a really clear photograph of Catherine while she was a fugitive. So nobody really knew what she might look like now. But the FBI agents had re-interviewed everybody, everybody, the new FBI agents did, everybody that had been interviewed 10 years before, and they found out that Catherine had, had, had augmenting surgery, breast implants, rhinoplasty, and they tracked down her plastic surgeon in Boston. And the plastic surgeon said, you know, I don't know if I have anything left that might be from that era. That's, you know, 15 years ago. So the FBI agents go about their business. One FBI agent's about to leave uh, the job one night to go to his uh, son's Little League game in Connecticut. And the uh, plastic surgeon says, uh, well, I have the files. And the FBI agent says, all right, I'll go pick them up on Monday. Well, do you want the pictures too? I'll be over in five minutes. <laughs> so these are the photographs, these very tight photographs of Catherine Gregg. And what the FBI did brilliantly was they created their own public service announcement. Now, Whitey Bulger had been featured on America's Most Wanted on Fox 13 times. And they had generated, those appearances had generated thousands of um, sightings. Anybody, any old guy with a Boston Red Sox hat and a <laughs> pair, you, my friend, the guy in the front row here. Yes. Um, you're, you're, you're lucky you could have been uh, brought in for questioning. But that was basically uh, how they treated it. And um, what the FBI did is they said, okay, we're going to create our own commercial. We're going to highlight these photographs, and we're going to tell the audience that she's in danger. And we don't know if she's in danger, but we're going to tell the audience she is. And we're going to um, air these commercials during Ellen, during Dr. Phil, during you know, shows in the midday that more women watch. So it'd be a, a sisterhood, if you will, that would ultimately drag down Whitey Bulger. So they run the uh, PSAs, and the only market that they didn't have enough money to run it in was LA, because they only had a certain amount of budget to, to run these uh, spots in. Fortunately, it became such a unique um, law enforcement tool, and then picked it up, the BBC picked it up, and there was a woman in Iceland 
who just happened to be um, Whitey Bulger and Catherine Gregg's former uh, neighbor. And she called the tip line amongst thousands. She didn't just say, he's a guy that looks like this. I've got a name and I've got an address. And she goes, um, uh, I know it's him. And well, how, how do you know? Well, myself and, and Catherine or uh, Carol Gasco was her alias. They fed a stray cat together. So again, it was a, a pet that ultimately brought Whitey Bulger down. And Whitey Bulger always said, that cat's going to be the friggin' death of me. And it <laughs> turned out, it kind of was. But another thing that really struck the, the neighbor was that Bulger was, um, he was incredibly racist. He hated Obama. And this woman was ultimately progressive. And she just hated this guy. So she, anything he ever said, said to her, she always remembered it, remembered everything he ever said. So she calls into the tip line, gives the address and the number. So this is inside Whitey Bulger's apartment. Now, there's a punching dummy on the, uh, the left-hand side. It's wearing a fedora, because that's why Bul Bulger would stick that in the uh, middle of a window, because he thought if anybody was going to come and kill him, that they would shoot that dummy first, and he would have an opportunity to either shoot back or get out with his life. So ultimately, it leads to this man right here. This guy, is, his name is Scott Gariola. He is the, uh, I would say, the most efficient FBI manhunter in the, age, in the Bureau's history. He has brought down several cartel members, uh, you know, drug lords, you name it. He's brought them in for the cold, from, uh, from the cold, I should say. He's on vacation at a uh, Dick's Sporting Goods in L.A. on the day they get the tip. And they know that he's going to be the one to bring him down because he's so damn good. So he gets a text, and it says, possible bulger sighting, call in. He's got his kids, he's got his fishing poles. Eh, I'm on vacation, but it's bulger. i got to call this in. So they, he calls, they give him the information, and he says, I need to talk to the tipster before I act on this. So they uh, transfer the call to Iceland and this woman. He, she goes through her story, and at the end of that 20-minute uh, conversation, she sa he says, I gotta be, I gotta know, uh, are, how sure are you that it's Bulger that we're looking for? She goes, oh, that's just it, Agent Gariola. I'm not 100%, it's him. I'm 200%, it's him. <laughs> and he says, game on. And he's gonna round up uh, his, his agents over a course of an hour to surround Bulger's building in Santa Monica. And none of the agents in the FBI even know who Whitey Bulger is. So he's gotta say, have you seen The Departed? Okay, it's, it's Jack Nicholson that we're trying to get. So he, you know, he's trying to convince them that it's a big deal. So he uh, eventually surrounds Bulger's apartment and lures him out of his apartment. And basically how he did it, it was a cat and mouse game. Because they knew that Bulger ultimately was never going to go without a fight. And that Bulger had several weapons in his apartment, which he did. So the only way to get him out was to lure him. And they said uh, they had the um, apartment house manager call Bulger and say, there's been a break-in in your, in your unit down in the basement. You know, um, we can call the police or you can come down and, and take a look at it. Bulger wasn't going to let him call the police. So he was going down the, uh, uh, the elevator and ultimately he gets there and he sees the agents. And Bulger wrote a letter to a friend where he describes how he felt going down the elevator. He said he knew. He knew something was wrong. And then there was a debate in the middle of uh, this um, standoff. Um, the Scott Gariola told Bulger to kneel down. Now look at what Bulger's wearing. He's wearing, wearing an all-white um, ensemble. Bulger wasn't going to kneel down because there was oil on the floor. And he didn't want to get his uh, pants dirty. So Bulger was almost ready to get his head blown off because he didn't want to look dirty for his uh, um, a, you know, arrest photo. And there was a woman doing laundry down in the uh, garage at the time. And Bulger's girlfriend, uh, Catherine, had always told the neighbors, because he was such a pain in the ass, that he's got Alzheimer's. He's, you know, he's got dementia. No, no, you know, don't worry about what he says. So this woman doing her laundry says, what are, you, what are you doing with this guy? He's got dementia. He's got Alzheimer's. You got the wrong guy. And Bulger looks at her and, and looks at the FBI agents and he says something very derogatory to her and says, no, you got the right guy. I'm Jimmy effing Bulger. 
This is Catherine and uh, Whitey being let off. These are the only photos that have ever been taken. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll show you this. These are some of the weapons that Bulger, that, th these were in his, in his apartment, in the walls that we were able to get access to when we uh, wrote the book itself. Um, this is Bulger, the last photograph ever of Whitey Bulger in prison. And he was uh, um, taking art classes uh, at a prison in Arizona. And ultimately, he had angered somebody in the prison system there. He got transferred to a place in um, Florida uh, near Orlando. And ultimately, he ends up at a place called Misery Mountain in West Virginia. And he's murdered 12 hours uh, after he arrives. Um, the man on the left, his name is Freddie Gius. He is Bulger's killer. We have interviewed him several times. We're the only ones who have ever interviewed Freddie, and we do it through correspondence. Freddie uh, writes us letters in a rubber chip pencil because the uh, guards won't give him anything sharp because they're afraid he's going to jab his neck or try to kill them. But um, we take you inside um, the cell when Bulger is murdered. We talk about the conspiracy behind it. It's the most uh, in-depth book uh, that's ever been written about the entire Bulger saga. And that is uh, Hunting Whitey. We don't have copies here, but you, know, you can get it in your local library if you want. And uh, next summer, get ready for Helltown. Helltown is a story about Kurt Vonnegut and Norman Mailer and their obsession with a murder case in 1969 in Provincetown. Now, I've covered maybe 150 homicides in my career. I've never seen anything this bad. It was absolutely vicious. A young hippie-like messiah, similar to Charles Manson, luring young women into a cemetery and not only killing them, but dismembering their bodies. Um, but the story itself is a story about Vonnegut and Mailer and who they were at various stages of their lives. In 1969, Norman Mailer was a household name. Nobody knew who Kurt Vonnegut was. He had not published Slaughterhouse Five yet. He's living right down the street here and he's angry. And he decides to put all of his passions and obsession into writing about this case. So I'm working with Robert Downey Jr. right now to adapt uh, this book for HBO. So Robert Downey Jr. is going to play Kurt Vonnegut. And we think Mark Ruffalo is going to play Mailer. And um, I'm going to test your 1980s trivia right now. There was a movie in the 1980s starring Rodney Dangerfield called Back to School. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. Robert Downey Jr. was in that movie. And Kurt Vonnegut had a cameo in that movie, which is what drew Robert Downey Jr. to this project. He said, I met him once, I was fascinated by him. He was an odd guy, but I thought he was so brilliant, I want to be a part of this project. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. So, I want to thank you everybody for uh, spending some time with me tonight. <laughs> Anybody has any questions, you can ask me here or down when I'm uh, doing some signing here. Any, anything? Yes. Well, I mean, you could bring a gun on a plane. You know, he brought a Chatter Arms 33 on a plane from uh, Honolulu to uh, uh, or New York without any license. Um, but again, it was, he was able to move very quickly without, um, you know, gun laws in place. And as I said, I mean, I think you, you look at some of the issues we struggle with as a society today, you know, they, they came to, uh, to bear, you know, in ultimately the assassination of John Lennon. And it's interesting that, you know, as we all know, George Harrison died of lung cancer, but he was attacked, you know, seven years before he ultimately died. And because he was stabbed so viciously in his lungs uh, when, he was, when he contracted cancer, he did not have the tissue uh, or the strength to withstand that disease, and he died. So there is a cause and effect of the attack on George and ultimately what happened to him. Anybody else? All right. Oh, yeah. We interviewed 20 people that knew John. Um, so, I, I, again, we have a whole list of, you know, people that, that we interviewed uh, in the book. 
uh, at least 40 hours of tape, including the six hours that I get drunk in New York City with the uh, <laughs> producer. That'll be the, uh, you know, unplugged version of uh, this, but uh, you're only as good as, a, as the access that, that you get. And I think because, you know, we're empathetic people and sympathetic and we tell, you know, stories the right way, people are more trustful uh, with us in the long run. So we've benefited from that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.